morning. So 10 days till Christmas. Who's ready? <laughs> kids, Pam, you're ready? I like it. Emma, you're ready? So I went to the, I made the mistake. Let me tell you, there's lots of people in Bradenton that aren't ready for Christmas. So uh, I made the mistake. I thought, you know, we're trying this technology with the two screens and trying to get off that glitchy. Uh, we were having some glitches with the wireless technology we were using. So I had to go to the Apple store yesterday. And I thought, eh, I'll just zip right in. I have this, this certain spot, like in South Bradenton, there's a small, the UTC mall right on the interstate. There's a certain parking area that only only I know of. <laughs> like, there's always parking spots there. It's only half filled. There's one little spot, and I can get in there, walk right in, walk right past Luke's store. I was looking for you, Luke, by the way. I didn't see you. So you must have been on your lunch break, or maybe you were working different hours. But I was looking in at your store trying to find you. But I made the mistake thinking, I just popped in real quick. Real quick. Like, go to my parking spot, my little private parking area where when I need to go to the mall, which by God's grace is not very frequently. Um, I park in this special spot, walk right in, zip right into the Apple store. You're like, they always have plenty of people working at the Apple store. Ain't no thing. Like, I'll just walk right in there, get my stuff, and leave. And sure enough, my parking area was filled. My, it was like my secret parking area, and I had to park like I think if I looked on my step counter, it would have been like 1,200 steps away from the entrance to the mall, which is a lot. And then I get to the Apple store. Like if I needed Microsoft, there would have been like four employees for every customer at Microsoft. Now, if you're a Microsoft guy, I'm sorry uh, for you. <laughs> but like four employees for every customer at the Microsoft store. At the Apple store, there was like 28 customers for every employee, like almost like you'd think they need a line to get in there. I just needed this one little plug. I just need this one little plug. Um, but there's lots of people, I learned, there's lots of people in South Bradenton that are not ready for Christmas yet, and I'm one of them. But if you think through Christmas, and as I was praying through how I wanted to lead us through the Word, because we, we finished a two and a half month study through the book of First Timothy, now we've got a three sermon series on Christmas. As I was trying to think through what I wanted, how I wanted to lead us through the Word this Christmas season, I came to three words, worship, love, and joy. Worship, love, and joy. And today we're looking at worship. Next Sunday, the 22nd, we'll look at love, that Christmas is a season of love. And the last Sunday is that Christmas is a season of joy. Or excuse me, Christmas Eve, the Christmas Eve service will be that Christmas is a season of joy. And what I would suggest to you is that we're not really ready for Christmas until and unless we have stopped to worship. Because I think Christmas is a season of worship first and foremost. And that's why we're starting here. Like if you think about all the stuff you'll have to do to get ready for Christmas. Like here's one thing I've got to do. I've got to go on Amazon and delete my kids' wish list. Because if their <laughs> list just magically disappear, Grace, I don't have to buy anything off of it. Alexa, what do you think about that? Where's Sean What do you think about that? Sean just shrugs his head. He's like, whatever, Dad. I know you're just joking. But... We think about all the stuff that we do to get ready for Christmas, to decorate the house, to put the tree up, to hang lights outside. It's going to happen, babe, I promise. It's going to happen. <laughs> hang lights outside, even if it happens Christmas Eve after the service, it'll happen, I promise. Um, to hang lights, to buy presents, to wrap presents, to make candy, to bake cakes, to whatever it is to make some gumbo. I'm guessing my friend James is going to make some gumbo. You make Christmas gumbo? I, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather Christmas gumbo than ham, James, so if you just tell us what time. Uh, to making gumbo, to whatever it is to get ready, where does stopping to worship come in? Where does stopping to worship come in? See, I believe that Christmas is first and foremost a season of worship. And when I say worship, here's what here's how I want the working definition I want us to think through. It should be on the slides, but it's not, because it's just not. Worship as an expression of our love, affection, and reverence for God. Worship, I'll say it slower for the kids to write it down. Worship is an expression of our love, 
our affection and reverence for God. Worship as an expression of our love, our affection, and our reverence for God. And there's so many elements and dynamics in there. Worship isn't music. Worship isn't preaching. Worship isn't coming together to take the Lord's Supper. Worship is all of those things. It's not like we have a time of worship and then a time of preaching. Our worship continues through all of the, 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 the time together as the God that gathered assembly. But ultimately, worship is an expression of our love, affection, and reverence for God. As you, as you look at the Gospel of Matthew, which Matthew, like I love Matthew. He was a tax collector. I used to be a banker. We have a lot in common. Um, anyway, he writes in a very logical way. He, he, he writes in this incredible story of Jesus' life, the things that the Holy Spirit inspired him to write. Four Gospels. Matthew is the first of those four. And interestingly, Matthew's Gospel is bookended by a time of worship. It starts with worship and it closes with worship. He says in, in Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 11a, the first part of verse 11, he says, after hearing the king, they went on their way. He's talking about the, the wise men. By the way, we don't know how many there were. They brought three gifts, but we don't know that there were just three wise men. And just spoiler alert, the wise men did not show up like a day after Jesus was born. And scriptures say he was a young child by the time they got there. So all of our major nativity sets are wrong, <laughs> including mine. But that's okay. We like it and it looks cute. So it says in Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, after hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. These are these men that studied the stars. Men from the east, they studied the stars, and they knew that there was something different about this one star. And these wealthy men traveled... And they saw him. And as soon as they saw him, they fell to their knees in worship. See, Christmas is first and foremost about worship. The expression of our love, affection, and reverence for God. But Matthew's account doesn't just open with an act of worship. It closes with an act of worship. Right before Jesus gave his disciples and you and me as an extension, the final command we call the great commission. We know the great commission is go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to remember all things that I have taught you. And wait a minute, I'll be with you forever as you do it. Amen. Like we know the great commission, but here's what happened before. It says in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 17, the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped. When they saw him, they worshipped. So we see Matthew's gospel opens with an expression of worship, an act of worship of the wise men that traveled from the east to see the young child that was Jesus. And it closes with an act of worship as they had seen the resurrected Christ on the mountain. When they saw him, they worshipped. It says here also, it says in Matthew 7, 20, 28, 17, but some doubted. In the midst of their doubts, in the midst of their fears, in the midst of their concerns, they worshipped. They worshipped. Their doubts did not prevent them from worshipping. And I would suggest to you, hear me loud and clear, that Christmas is first and foremost the season of worship. Like, you are not ready for Christmas until you have stopped to reflect on the greatness of Christ, the majesty of Christ, and, as, and, and expressed your love, affection, and reverence for God, seen in Christ. Christmas is a season of worship. 
And I would suggest to you that the entirety of a Christian life should be an expression of worship. From the moment Jesus saves us to the moment that he calls us home should be an expression of worship. Our entire lives as a life of worship. Christmas is first and foremost a season of worship. If you have a Bible, you're just getting warmed up this morning, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. If you need to use your table of contents, use your table of contents. That's why it's there. Feel free to use that. That's how we learn the books of the Bible, by looking at the table of contents. Many of us have learned in that way, including myself. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It's going to be on the screens. I want to encourage you, though, to, to make sure you're looking at a copy, uh, 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 whether it's on the screens or on your phone or in your lap, in the same translation that we're using, which is the CSB, the Certified South Brayton Bible. Christian Standard Bible for some, I call it the Certified South Brayton Bible. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Will you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, as we look to your word, God, I pray that each of us, God, would be worshipers, true worshipers, Lord. That your spirit would work in our lives and cut us deep to our soul, Father. And that your spirit and word working together would leave us changed this morning. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to give a plug for scripture memory this morning, the discipline of scripture memory, which is often overlooked. I would encourage you. This Christmas season, as Christmas is a, is a first and foremost a time of worship, I would encourage you to consider committing these two verses to memory and memorize them in whatever translation you read from on a daily basis. But commit these two word, these two verses to memory. It's two verses. Um, I know my kids can do it. I, I know I've done it. Um, even Dylan, my eight-year-old, anyone from eight to ninety-eight, can still do it. You really anyone from like as long as you can talk, you can probably memorize this. Parents, teach it to your kids. Memorize these two verses together with your kids. How can we keep Christmas as a first and foremost a season of worship? To memorizing scripture together that talks about all of our lives as an act of worship. Paul starts these two verses. It's really a transitioning point in, in the book of Romans. 12, chapter 12 transitions. So for 11 chapters, Paul has laid out the greatness of Jesus, the greatness of God's grace, that, that we are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. He's laid out all this kind of stuff, and he says, therefore, it's like the, what do we do in response to this? He says, therefore, in chapter 1 of Romans, Paul lays out the depravity of all people, that all people have seen God and all people have rejected God, that God the Father is evident in creation in every single person because of the depravity of their own hearts, the wickedness in their own soul has rejected that. Then he talks in chapter 2, therefore, therefore, in chapter 2 he says the righteousness of God has judged, that God is a righteous judge, not a wicked judge, but God is a righteous and good judge. What is Paul saying therefore in chapter 12? And he, he's referring back to chapter 3 where he wrote that the guilt of the whole world, that all humanity is guilty. There is no one righteous, no, not one. Not a single person that has ever walked the planet has been righteous apart from Jesus. Every one of us bears the guilt of Adam. Every one of us, the moment we can make a moral choice, we will choose wrongly. Every one of us. Therefore, what's Paul writing? Therefore, in response to everything he's written before. Therefore, he talks in chapter 4, the, the faith of Abraham. 
and how Abraham responded to God's promise to him in faith. Therefore, in chapter 5, he says the righteousness that comes through faith alone. Therefore. In chapter 6, he says, therefore, you've been alive in Christ that you are a son. You are no longer a slave, but a son. Therefore. Let your mind wrap around that, that we go to God as a son and a daughter, not a servant. You know the difference? How many slaves or servants go to the king at 3 in the morning with the problem? When my two boys and my two daughters have a problem at 3 in the morning, they come to me. See, we approach God as a son and daughter, not a servant or a slave to sin. Therefore, therefore, all of this is what Paul's writing in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where he starts with this word, therefore, like I'm reflecting on everything I've written before, therefore, we see in Romans chapter 7, where we have this, this picture of schizophrenic Paul, we'll call him. In Romans 7, he says, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body? He says, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. I am so wrecked on the inside. Who will save me? Therefore... Romans chapter 8, he says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is good news. Therefore. Romans chapter 8, we have this incredible hymn at the end. He says, What are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but he offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justified. Who is the one who condemns Christ? Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He is also at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Therefore, in response to that, we get Romans chapter 12. Therefore, who can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Can affliction, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or sword, as is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No! In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of the mercies of God, because in all these things, we are more than conquerors. For I am persuaded, Paul would write, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor powers, nor principalities, nor things past, present, or things to come, nor any other created thing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Therefore. See, before we come to Romans chapter 12, we see this incredible word, therefore, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. We need to talk, we need to understand what Paul is writing about. Therefore, in chapter 9, he says, he gives God's righteousness in election, that God is just in electing people to be saved, calling people from their sin, telling them to turn to Jesus. In chapter 10, we see Paul's heart for the lost. Let me tell you, Paul was a missionary. He says in Romans chapter 10 that he wished he could be accursed for the sake of his countrymen, that they may be saved. He wanted to trade his salvation to see his people come to know Jesus. His heart was broken for the lost. Therefore, see, all of this is what Paul is responding to in Romans chapter 12 as the entire letter turns. And it says, therefore. And then we have this beautiful hymn of praise in Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36, where he says, all oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and of the knowledge of God how unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor and who has ever given to God that he should be repaid from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever amen therefore Don't just see that word as just whatever. We just keep keep busting through on our reading plan. There, 
4 in view of the mercies of God therefore in view brothers and sisters in view of the mercies of God I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God this is your true act of worship first thing we see here is that the mercies of God demand a response. <coughs> the mercies of God demand a response. When we think about the word mercy, we think about not getting what we really deserve. Not getting what our sinfulness deserves. Not getting what our, the, our own personal violation of God's holiness really deserves. The mercies of God demand a response. See, sadly, we live in an environment filled with entitlement. Like, ask my children, like one of my children, their favorite phrase, two words, not fair. Not fair. Not fair. I'm not going to tell you which one it is, one of my kids, their favorite two-word phrase is not fair. Or, 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 where's mine? Not fair, where's mine? See, they don't have to be taught that. They have just picked it up. It's part of who they are. Part of the environment in which we live. An environment filled with entitlement. They said, not fair, Dad. That's not fair. Where's mine, Dad? But if we see the mercies of God, if we allow this book to inform us of the mercies of God, as we experience the mercies of God deep into our soul, we will see that that's right. He's, he's not fair with us. Because he's not giving us what we deserve. Because Christ has borne the punishment for my sin on the cross. The truth of our condition is that we don't, hear me, we don't deserve another breath. We don't. And if we think through the character of God, like, yeah, God is love, absolutely. God is gracious and merciful. But God is righteous and holy, and he hates sin. But we see in the cross that he's patient, and that he's forgiving, and he's merciful. And the point here that I want to make as we approach Christmas as an act of worship is that we need to see that none of us has ever gotten what we deserve. Instead, we've been shown great mercy. And the mercies of God demand a response. The greatness of God shown in the mercy that he has displayed to us demands a response. And what I would suggest to you, according to God's word, is that the only acceptable response to the mercies of God is a life of worship. The only expect acceptable response is a life of worship. In the Old Testament system, the sacrifice, an animal sacrifice, was central to their act of worship, an animal sacrifice. And there were five sacrifices prescribed for the Old Testament people of God in the book of Leviticus. Four of the five required an animal. Four of the five required an animal. Now, the animal was sacrificed in the place of the one that brought it. And Paul uses this same phrase when he says to, to urge. It's as if he's screaming to, to his original readers and screaming to us to present ourselves. Like we don't have to present an animal anymore. We present ourselves, not as a dead sacrifice, but as a living sacrifice. You know that word present? Where he says, I urge you to present your bodies. That word present comes from the phrase that, the, that we would use for the priest to bring an offering to the altar. It's the same language. It's the same language that, that we would have, that, that the Old Testament saints would have said, the priest is presenting my offering. 
He's calling us to present ourselves. Present ourselves, not as a debt sacrifice, but as a living sacrifice. Because our worship of God is no longer governed by what takes place at a temple in the Middle East. In view of God's great mercies, we are called to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. And if you are in Christ this morning, and when I say in Christ, meaning you have repented from your sin and are trusting in Jesus... Not you go to church, not, well, um, I believe in a God, or I believe in a concept of a God, or I believe in a grandfatherly type of figure of a God. I mean, if you are in Christ, if Christ has given you new life, hear me, hear me loud and clear. If any of you are in Christ, you are a priest. You are a priest, and you have an offering to present. That's really good news. Peter would say that we are a royal priesthood. Called the priesthood of all believers. All believers. We don't need to go to a priest. Nonsense. That priest needs to go to Jesus. Just like you need to go to Jesus and I need to go to Jesus. The priesthood of all believers says that you and I are priests and we have an offering to present, and that is our lives for the glory of God and the good of others. You can approach God in worship, but it gets even better. It gets even better. Because we present ourselves as living sacrifices. Not dead sacrifices that needed to be repeated and repeated and repeated. Jesus has been sacrificed once for all and in response to the great mercies of God, we as priests of God present our offering, the offering of ourselves in response what type of worship is it that brings honor to God? He says in, in verse 1, the end, this is your true worship. Your true worship. Suggesting to me that there is a false type of worship. There is a true type of worship and there is a false type of worship. The false type of worship says, well, Jesus, you can have this, but I got this. Jesus, I'll do whatever you say as long as you don't move me from South Brayton. Jesus, I'll do whatever you say as long as you don't take my kids as missionaries to the Middle East. Jesus, I'll do whatever you say as long as we keep our health. And we got a little bit of money left in the bank after we pay our bills and have some fun. As long as that's taken care of, Jesus, I'll do whatever you say. When we present all of ourselves as a living Sacrifice. That is a true act of worship. And that is the type of worship that Jesus honors. There is nothing that is off limits. Nothing that is off limits. See, I'm absolutely convinced in American churches all over the globe. Excuse me. That, hello. American churches. American churches all over this country. There is an idol of comfort that has never been laid down. In my own life, I had to sacrifice the idol of comfort in order to plant this church. And I can tell you story after story about how Victoria and I have had to sacrifice the idol of comfort in our own lives to follow Jesus. There is a type of worship that God abhors, he hates. And it's false. And it says, Jesus, you can have this, but I gotta keep all of this to myself. See, in the Old Testament sac sacrificial system, when they brought animal sacrifices, like the animal gave everything, right? And it wasn't like, we're just gonna make you a little bit dead. Like we make the animal completely dead. Right, the animal offered everything. Everything that the animal wanted. It was supposed to be a perfect animal. The New Testament is we offer ourselves in view of God's great mercies. As we offer ourselves as living sacrifices, doesn't mean we get to hold anything back. The moment we trust in Jesus as Lord means he calls the shots. 
We don't get to negotiate. We don't get to argue. He calls the shots, period. What type of worship brings honor to God? Offering of all of who we are. There's this song, this incredible song. It says, All that I am for all that you are. We offer all that we have, all that we are, for all that Jesus is. There's an individual aspect to this, there's a corporate aspect to this. See, I believe so strongly in a corporate worship gathering. I believe. The church has to come together on the Lord's Day to worship, to worship together through singing, to worship together through preaching and praying and taking of the Lord's Supper. And that's our foundation for the rest of the week. It's not like we come together for an hour and 10 minutes or an hour and 30 minutes, depending on how long I talk. We don't come together for a few moments on Sunday morning and say, oh, we, we worship this week. We check, check it off. We come together as a foundation for living our lives the rest of the week as an act, an expression of our worship. Paul uses this phrase, holy and pleasing. And some direct translations use the word acceptable. And there's two ways that I, I want to say that, that our worship can be made acceptable. It's offered in faith. It's offered in faith. To offer all that you are, to sacrifice the idol of comfort, the idol of family, the idol of career, the idol of kids, the idol of a report card, the idol of being having the right friends at school, whatever your life situation is, to sacrifice the idol in your life requires an act of faith. It must be offered in faith. It's a, a trustful surrender that says, in essence, I know the character of God, I know the mercies of God, and I trust in both completely. And I surrender my life for the glory of God and the good of others. It's offered in faith, but it's also offered in obedience. <clears throat> One that says, I will obey regardless of the cost. And scripture and church history are both filled with countless examples of believers obeying at great personal cost. of God's mercies in the view of everything that Paul has written Romans 1 through 11 he says therefore I urge you brothers and sisters to present yourselves as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God this is your true act of worship the question really for each of us today is what are you holding back what area of your life are you refusing to offer in faith? What area of your life are you refusing to offer in obedience? Because Jesus calls for everything. And as we offer ourselves, and there's this picture in verse 2, he says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. As we offer ourselves, we trust that Jesus is renewing our minds. He says, don't be conformed. Don't be conformed. But be transformed by the renewing of our minds. As we fill our minds with the word of Christ. As we allow the spirit of God to work together with the word of God in our lives. Those two things, just as a side note, those two things will never contradict Something, one another. Like, if you ever come to me for like pastoral counseling or whatever, and you say, I believe Jesus wants me to do this, and it's in direct opposition to the Word of God, I will say, You are wrong. Because the Spirit of God always works together with the Word of God. And the Spirit of God, it's also called the Spirit of Truth, will never violate Scripture. Period. Ever. As we fill our minds with the word of Christ, Genesis to Revelation, this book, 
And as we allow the Spirit of God to work together with the Word of God in our lives, our minds will be renewed. In Colossians chapter 3, there's this glorious section, this, this, this verse 10, this is, you are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your Creator. That's really good news, that, that Jesus is renewing us. He's not renewing us ignorantly. He's renewing us in knowledge according to His image. That's good news. As we fill our minds with the Word, as we trust the Spirit to work, we will be renewed and we will have be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Christmas, every day, not just Christmas, but every day, is first and foremost about worship. The truth is, is that every one of us will worship something. Every one of us is going to worship something. I've got friends that worship their careers. I've got friends that worship their kids' achievements. I've got friends that worship the lifestyle that their careers afford. I've got friends that worship their appearance, their public appearance before others. I even know people, I have friends and family that worship other people in their family. Kind of crazy, right? Yeah, that's what I thought too. Like you can see it in their lives, that they're worshiping a family member. For our kids, our kids are constantly going to be tempted to worship their performance in school, in choir, in band, in sports, their friends' opinion of them, whatever it is. Every one of us is going to be tempted to worship something other than Jesus. Because we were created to worship. And we're going to worship something. And so what I want to beg you this morning, as my family that I love deeply, I want to beg you. Christmas really is about worship first and foremost, and it is. In view of God's great mercies, how would you worship Jesus this Christmas season? And how will you carry that on past the Christmas season? Individually, how will you worship Jesus individually this Christmas season? As a family, how will you worship Jesus this Christmas season? With your church family, how will you worship Jesus this Christmas? Will you allow the mercies of God to fuel your devotion to Christ, leading you to a life of worship? See, that can only happen. I believe there's a starting point in the Christian life. In John chapter 3, Jesus says you must be born again. So to be born, it, it, that happens in a moment, right? And that carries for a lifetime. That happens in a moment. See, the starting place of, of offering ourselves as a life, as, as, as worshipers, lifestyle of worship, the starting place is coming to that realization that you need Jesus. You need Jesus. Like, I don't care how much church you've got, you need Jesus. I don't care your daddy was a preacher, you need Jesus. Until and unless we have that starting point, we will never respond to the great mercies of God. See, that response starts in a moment and carries on for a lifetime. And that starts in a time of repentance where we turn from our sin. We turn from something and we to turn to something else. Where we turn from and turn to. I want to invite you today, right now, December 15th in Brampton, Florida, to turn to Jesus and live. I think that starts in a moment and continues for a lifetime. And we don't do this every every week at RCM, but I'm just going to invite you to bow your heads and just, just close your eyes with no one looking around. I just want to call you with 10 days before Christmas. Perhaps today is the day when you will turn to Jesus and live. So when everyone just, just trust me enough to bow your heads and close your eyes and pray for the people around you. And if you know you need Jesus, would you just look?
look up at me right now. You know you need Jesus. You know you've never met Jesus before. And you need Jesus in your life right now. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And just pray down in your spirit. Jesus, I need you. I need to have life from you today. Deep in your soul, would you pray that prayer right now? And say, Jesus, forgive me. I want to experience your mercy in this life that Paul has talked about. I need you today to give me new life. Without anyone looking around to check out, see who's looking or whatever, would you just slip up your hand if you prayed that prayer for the first time today? Slip up your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God, we love you so much. God, for these that have trusted in Jesus today, Lord, I pray that they would know deep down in their bones the mercy that you have shown to them. Father, I pray that this faith that starts in a moment continue on for a lifetime. God, that you would assure them by your spirit and through your word. Lord, that they would know the power of your presence and your love this Christmas season. God, you are so good to us. 